This is Earth Files, the award-winning news site with the latest updates in science, environment, and real X-Files. Podcasting in-depth reports beyond the 6 o'clock news by Emmy Award-winning journalist Linda Moulton Howe. Large, hairy, primate-looking Sasquatch, or Bigfoot, have been reported in North America and other parts of the world for more than a century. Some eyewitnesses have described seeing male and female Sasquatch with smaller animals thought to be Sasquatch juveniles. Even though no one has gotten any clear photographs, movie film, or videotapes of young ones, eyewitnesses say large Sasquatch have been known to aggressively protect their territory and presumably their family. Campers have described having rocks thrown at them and been physically charged by big, growling, long-haired ape creatures apparently trying to get humans out of their perceived territory. In mid-September 2007, deer hunter Rick Jacobs was not thinking about Sasquatch Bigfoot when he placed a deer mineral lick and deer-attracting scents where he set up his Bushnell game trail camera in northwestern Pennsylvania. All he wanted to know was how many deer, especially big bucks, were using the trail so that he could plan his deer hunt. The location is three hours north of Pittsburgh in very remote forest. Mr. Jacobs' camera automatically senses light and can take color photos in daytime and switch to infrared at night with or without flash. The camera was set to go off with motion in front of the lens. On three frames dated September 16, 2007, beginning at 4 minutes and 23 seconds after 8 p.m. local time, there are two black bear cubs at the block of the mineral lick. Then, almost a half hour goes by, and at 27 minutes and 42 seconds later, the mineral lick is knocked over, and there is an animal that looks more like a primate than a bear, but the head is not visible. And then 36 seconds after that, a third image shows the primate-looking animal in a posture that at first is confusing. But to people knowledgeable about primate behavior, the odd posture could be an animal that is smelling something on the ground while its buttocks is up in the air. The deer hunter, Rick Jacobs, was so puzzled about what his game trail camera had photographed that he started showing the images to his family and friends. His teenage daughter suggested it might be a juvenile Sasquatch or Bigfoot. She searched on the Internet and came to the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, also known as BFRO. BFRO was formed more than a decade ago in 1995 by a group of field investigators who wanted to pool resources for expeditions to find Sasquatch. The group's director is Matthew Moneymaker, who has been on 40 Sasquatch expeditions and been within 100 feet of the big, hairy primates at least a dozen times. Once in the moonlight at 2 a.m., Matthew was approached by an 8-foot-tall, hairy creature that was growling only 15 feet away. Matthew told me, quote, I didn't feel he wanted to kill me. He just wanted us to move out of his territory, unquote. By Friday, October 19th, with the deer hunter's permission, Matthew placed the three images on the BFRO website for feedback. That night, I interviewed him and began by asking Matthew what his own personal first reaction was to the infrared images. Oh, I immediately knew that it was a young squatch, especially to see the bear cubs and using that as a gauge of the size and knowing that this is a fairly small figure, and especially the quadrupedal stance. Like in the first image, people think, oh, it's leaning over it. I've told them, I said, no, that's the way they walk. That's the thing walking along as it normally does, what you see in the first image. And I've talked to a few witnesses who've seen them run quadrupedally, and then they'll get up on two legs. The photo one, it is leaning and stretching out, and you do not see a clear picture of the head And then in the next photograph, which at first is confusing, but then if you look at 
the top of the creature as being its buttocks going straight up in the air and that it has its head down. That makes some sense out of that second photo. And I think you've talked with somebody about this being a chimpanzee type of behavior. Yes, apes will very often smell the ground and they will get in that kind of a posture. They'll outstretch their arms and they'll put their face right into the ground like that. Did the hunters go back to that site and look for any of the larger 14 to 17 to 18 inch prints that have become associated with Sasquatch? I believe they did. They mentioned that. They even said they were surprised that they didn't find any larger tracks there. But you're only going to get clear tracks if you have exposed soil. And even then, it's got to be exposed either wet soil like mud or very loose soil like sand. So you just don't get very clear, obvious tracks in, in most situations because usually in a forest, the ground is not exposed. It has pine needles and leaves and sticks and it's usually got a good layer of that if it's a dense forest. They didn't find any, but of course they're looking for them now. <laughs> well, that's good. Is it fair to say that you and BFRO are convinced that this is the clearest photograph of a young Sasquatch that anybody has been able to record? I believe it is. As far as ones that have been circulated, yeah, these are far and away the most compelling. The camera was damaged twice, or the two cameras were damaged there at that trail? Yes. I had asked them, you know, after I saw the photos, I said, are the cameras still up there? And the brother said they had to take them down because they got broken and they had to get them fixed. And he goes, the first one, something had smashed the lens, and they sent it back to Bushnell, and they got it repaired. And then they put out another camera, the same type, and it got smashed even more. Both brothers, they didn't know what this figure was, this small figure. They didn't know what we knew about the history, at least among Bigfoot researchers, of placing cameras out where Sasquatches are seen and, and then coming back and finding them smashed. Right. And isn't it true that it is the flashes on cameras that seems to provoke the attention of the Sasquatch Bigfoot? It might be the flash, and it may be simply the appearance of the camera, a man-made object, on the side of a tree, it could very well be that it's the flash. And I'll tell you, when we've set up game cameras, flash cameras, when you walk in front of a flash game camera and it goes off at night, it will blind you temporarily. I mean, you won't be able to see anything for a little while because it's such a bright flash. I'll tell you, if, if, I, and if I was walking through the woods and then one flashed at me, I'd be a little angry myself, and I, I might want to do something to that camera. <laughs> and in some cases where you know, they put them on a tree and found the tree pushed over so it would fall onto the camera. Uh, people that we've talked to who've tried to use trail cameras to get photos of these things have described that numerous times. I'll tell you, the researchers who put those cameras out there thought it was the thing that they were trying to photograph had actually damaged the camera. And you mean Sasquatch. Yes. <laughs> I always remember one particular witness who I, I got to know very well, and he had helped take me to the place where I had the closest encounter I ever had to one, where I had one walk up with about 15 feet away from me. It was growling at me. Not far from there, he had been pursued by a young one, and it ran, and they would see them at night in the dark, and they described them almost as panther-like running very agilely on all fours and being able to climb and go over fences, climb up a fence and then down the other side of the fence using, you know, its arms and legs as it was climbing up a fence, being able to climb up in a tree and sit up on its haunches. And there is other, from other parts of the country, there were sketches of young ones, again, showing them in that kind of quadrupedal stance. So this is very consistent with what we folks in the BFRO had suspected a young one would look like. I've been close to these things on several occasions. The behavior, you know, the, the way they'll come up and they'll growl and they'll follow you and sometimes they'll throw things. And there was one occasion they would only would have taken a few steps to be right on top of me. Well, when was that? What date? Where? And how big was this Sasquatch? I was about seven and a half feet tall, and it was July 1994 in Portage County, Ohio, in the Berlin Wildlife Refuge in Ohio. We were staking out this road coming out of the, the wildlife refuge, leading into a farming area where a lot of the farmers in the area had reported seeing them and hearing them and finding their tracks. 
we were staking that out, expecting them to come out along this road, and they did. <laughs> but we think it was because the light coming out of our night vision devices of the guy I was with, we think they spotted us first, and they kind of went into, the, instead of walking down the road in front of us, they circled around, and they bluff charged at him, and then the larger one came up around in back of me and came to the edge of the tree line, and I was kind of hunkered down behind a little berm, and uh, came out and growled at me and let me know that it knew I was there and that I shouldn't be there. I mean, that was certainly the, I mean, it was the sense that I got about it. And I got up and was talking in its direction, like you would, if you had a dog come in your direction and growl at you, how you would kind of instinctively say, okay, all right, that's what I was doing toward this thing as I was picking up all my stuff and walking away. And I wasn't really scared as much I was happy because, well, I knew the thing, if it stopped and growled in the way the kind of raspy way it was growling, I knew that's all it was going to do. And the fact that it wouldn't come out very far, it was staying right at the tree line so it could just take a step back and it would disappear back into the brush. It was partial moonlight and it was about 2.30 a.m. So I could see the shape of the thing. I could see that it was hairy and it was about seven to eight feet tall and that it was clearly not a person. The proportions were just way off the scale. The guy who was with me, who they had bluff charged, he was about eh, close to 100 feet away. He did shine a light on it, and he did a detailed drawing of it. And we have a page on the website about eyewitness sketches from Ohio, and there's one of the sketches was from what he saw that night. It's on our website. Ohio is right on the border with western Pennsylvania. It is indeed. And there's a lot of sightings in especially eastern Ohio, and in western Pennsylvania, and we believe the reason is because there's a large deer population. And for you, you are absolutely convinced that Sasquatch exists, and you've had your own firsthand experiences. Why do you think that this creature remains mythological for most of the population? Why has one not been captured in the last 100 or 200 years? Or so? <laughs> if you were in the thick of it like we are, and you'd say, well, where would they go? Where would they hide? It's funny because when you go to the sorts of remote places that we go, you know that humans in these vast areas only will walk along, say, the roads or the trails and will only be like upon, you know, 2% of that land. And it's dangerous to walk off of a trail or a road in a really thick, rugged, you know, area and then try to capture them. That would assume that, like, everyone is trying to capture them, whereas no one is trying to capture them. And these things operate at night. I have this interview at my news website, earthfiles.com. At the top of the headlines page, there are hot links to the BFRO website where you can keep up with their Sasquatch research and expeditions. Matthew Moneymaker hopes that more hunters will set out game trail cameras with infrared at night, so hopefully more images like Rick Jacobs could emerge. One of the few academics to take the Sasquatch Bigfoot phenomenon seriously is Jeff Meldrum, Ph.D., professor of human anatomy at Idaho State University, where he has taught for the past 14 years. His book, Sasquatch, Legend Meets Science, was released in September 2006. Professor Meldrum also has more than 200 plaster casts of alleged Bigfoot Sasquatch footprints, some of which he has gathered himself from field investigations. When I asked Professor Meldrum about the infrared images, he said, quote, It's intriguing, unquote. At first, he did not think the limb proportions in the photograph could be a bear because they are so long, but he cautioned that the infrared images might be a black bear following the two cubs. But we also talked about the fact that the evolution of Sasquatch Bigfoot from birth to adulthood is not known. He said it's possible that the young primates could have proportions more similar to a chimpanzee, as might be the case in these infrared images. That question was provoked by the size of the feet in the infrared photographs, which are smaller in proportion to the limbs than the very large feet on the full-grown adults. Professor Meldrum said the characteristics that he uses to distinguish a human track from a Sasquatch track are the Sasquatch footprints don't show arches like human feet do, the Sasquatch prints are much wider, 
Sasquatch toe prints are much longer, and Sasquatch heel prints are much wider than humans, particularly in contrast to the remainder of the foot. Professor Meldrum told me, quote, But maybe some of those features don't manifest themselves to the extent that they are evident in a typical Sasquatch track until the Sasquatch individual has obtained a much greater bulk and greater weight, which would mean a juvenile Sasquatch might look more like a chimpanzee until it grows up to the seven to eight foot tall, huge creatures that in a few cases photographed. Finally, Professor Meldrum stressed, as Matthew Moneymaker says, that Sasquatch's apparent strategy is to avoid human contact whenever possible, which is why we don't know much about the mysterious creatures, whether young or adult. And it's intriguing. Obviously, the limb proportions are not bear-like. It seems to be very long-legged and long-limbed. The proportions look more like a chimpanzee than they do like a human. Throughout the decades of the reports of Sasquatch, Bigfoot, all of the film and or sketches have been on what we would say were adults, large bodies, and there have been some eyewitness accounts of large Sasquatch, Bigfoot, with small versions, like children or young. Matthew Moneymaker was saying that one of the questions has always been, well, if this is real, then where are the young? Where are the offspring of these large ones? Could it be that this is the first clear photograph, even if it's an infrared, of a young Sasquatch and that we are missing its growth process and that it may be more like a chimpanzee at a young age than it is later? Right. We have no data on those developmental trajectories. And if we consider even our own species, if we look at the limb proportions of an infant and a toddler, and you know, especially in a newborn, the hind limbs are exceptionally underdeveloped. And you're right, the limb proportions would better approximate those of a non-human primate, adult non-human primate. These animals, presumably, if they're like other great apes, also have that period of dependency, but may become ambulatory at a much earlier time, but may still not exhibit the full-blown limb proportions of an adult, and may have, like you were describing, much more chimpanzee-like. So that raises a very, very interesting possibility, absolutely. There's a lot we don't know, and we really don't know what the development of the foot of a Sasquatch might look like through its growth trajectory. Can they be distinguished from human tracks? If they can't, I mean, that raises some curious questions about just the mechanics of the gait and locomotor adaptations of this species. But Meaning, why would it be so human-like? Exactly. Because the characteristics that we're distinguishing, you were using to distinguish a human track from a Sasquatch track are in a Sasquatch, the lack of an arch, the greater breadth, the relatively longer toes, the much greater breadth of the heel, particularly in contrast to the remainder of the foot. But maybe some of those features don't manifest themselves to the extent that they're evident in the uh, typical Sasquatch track until the individual has attained a much greater bulk, a much greater weight. And I would expect that if this is a juvenile, that it would be a fairly a young adult one. Otherwise, it wouldn't necessarily be there all by itself without a female close by. And that goes right to the hunter that we're calling R. Jacobs concern when he contacted BFRO and Matthew Moneymaker. It was, if this is a young Sasquatch, then are there bigger ones there? And is it safe for us to go back and deer hunt? Right. Well, I would say yes to both those questions. If indeed this is a young Sasquatch, and that's still a large if, but if it is, then yes, I would not think that a Sasquatch of this size, and presumably (laughs) the reason it got its picture taken, uh, lack of experience. Mm -hmm. But then again, I think the only concern that a hunter would have, a deer hunter would have, is the very concern they would have with any other form of wildlife, that an animal is going to react in a protective way to ensure the safety of its offspring. And so if this hunter found himself caught between a juvenile or infant and an adult of any species, 
then he would probably be in a little bit of a precarious situation. But I think otherwise, if these animals were posing the type of threat that other wildlife, like mountain lions, cougars, or black bear or brown bear, pose to humans, they would be more well-known. They would be recognized. That's what's led to the demise of those species is their threat to humans, whereas Sasquatch's apparent strategy is to avoid as much as possible human contact and has remained on the fringe of recognition, has stayed elusive and mysterious. Thanks for listening to this Earth Files podcast from the edges of science, environment, and real X-Files. Go to www.earthfiles.com to see more than a thousand Earth Files reports with photographs, drawings, and documents. And visit Earth Files every day, every week, for new reports and new podcasts. That's www.earthfiles.com. 